also the test procedure is the same wherein I mean the test cycle is the same wherein you apply a repeated load indirect tension test but the load duration and the frequency is fixed. It is mentioned that you should apply the load for 0.1 seconds and the rest period is given as 0.9 seconds. So, your total cycle length becomes 1 uh, second or it is a 1 hertz frequency cycles. Okay. And then you have a total uh, load which is P max and there should be always certain contact load given say for example 4 percentage of the total. So, this is your total load 4 percentage of the total load is given as contact load so that your, uh, your specimen and the loading strip will not lose contact. Okay. So, but also this is mentioned that this should not exceed 89 Newton. So, there should be at least 22.2 Newton of contact load and also it should not exceed 89 Newton is what is suggested. And the compressive Haversine load that is that you apply is of the form of 1 minus cos theta by 2. Uh, the specimen dimensions are like this, you have a diameter of 101.6 or you can go for a larger diameter of 152.4 with thickness of 38.1 or 63.5. Uh, the specimen can be cast either using a Marshall compaction or you can go for a gyratory compactor or field core samples can also be tested. Only thing is that you should have a sufficiently neat sewn surface. The load that is to be applied is 10 to 20 percentage of ITS. So, this is different from the previous version there was it was 10 to 50 percentage of ITS. Now, here the load that you have to apply that is the P max ok. The P max has to be 10 to 20 percentage of the indirect tensile strength value and the load duration as I said is 0 0.1 second loading and 0 0.9 second of rest period and the test temperature is specified as 25 degrees Celsius. It is suggested that you can do it for other temperatures as well say 5 degree 15 and 20 and at every temperature you can do it at one particular frequency say 1 hertz frequency ok. And uh, your specimen has to be conditioned at least 6 hours of conditioning is required so that your entire specimen is at the test temperature. Now, another improvement that is made in the new ASTM standard is where to fix this uh, LVDTs. In the earlier version, the LVDTs were fixed only on one uh, face or you can say the one plane. Okay, if you have right plane and left plane, it was only fixed either on the right or the left. Uh, so, it could uh, in include some amount of uh, repeatability issues because as you cast the specimen and you keep it like this, some may keep uh, place the LVDTs on the top surface of the specimen or some may keep it on the bottom surface of the specimen. As I said it can be on the right side or it can be on the left side. So, in order to avoid that issue here it is suggested that you have to place LVDTs on both the planes on the right as well as on the left ok. And uh, regarding the gauge length as I earlier mentioned this total diameter as the gauge length could be a problem. So, here it is suggested to have three different gauge lengths. One is a quarter gauge length, half gauge length and full diameter ok. As you can see here in this case your LVDT is connected for the full length of the uh, specimen or the full diameter whereas here it is connected for the middle half portion whereas here it is connected at the middle quarter portion ok. So, these three gauge lengths can be suitably chosen and accordingly you can find either any one of these you can adopt. So, this is how the uh, specimen is aligned and how the LVDTs are connected. Uh, you have to first of all mark the axis as shown here. You have a uh, groove where you can keep it uh, horizontally and then the markings can be done. And then there is a fixing uh, an alignment device. Uh, so, that alignment device can be properly fixed on top wherein these gauge points can be fixed. So, you see here these are the gauge points uh, being fixed through the alignment device and they are glued into the surface and hence in these gauge points you can connect the LVDT. So, this last figure shows the LVDT is connected in both the horizontal and vertical direction and in this code it is very clearly specified that you have to collect information both in the horizontal as well as in the vertical direction. So, this is the test procedure. First of all you have to conduct the ID, uh, indirect tensile strength test on a similar specimen at 25 degrees Celsius and find out what is the indirect tensile strength and 
10 to 20 percentage of that will be taken for the testing as mentioned. Uh, so, to, uh, you select the load here. Then you place the uh, LVDTs and this testing will be first done in the uh, along the first diametral axle. Say for example, this is on plane 1, this is the 0 degree ar arrangement. Say for example, your B is in this direction and your LVDT A is in here, okay, in the vertical direction. Now you do the preconditioning cycles as mentioned here is 100 preconditioning cycles, it is specified and after 100 preconditioning the last uh, uh, then the next 5 cycles will be taken as the test cycles. Okay? So, you capture the information during those 5 test cycles. Then you rotate it along the uh, in, at 90 degree. So, what happens is that your A goes here and B comes here. So, you turn it 90 degree, keep the specimen and then again repeat the procedure of 100 preconditioning cycles and 5 test cycles. So, uh, this is how the procedure is conducted. So, you have 5 te test cycles in one uh, plane uh, in one arrangement of 0 degree and you have 5 test cycles in the second arrangement of 90 degree. This is the data that is collected from plane 1 that is the right side plane. Similarly, you have LVDTs on the left plane. So, that is plane 2. You will have 5, five cycles of data when it is placed in the 0 degree arrangement and you will have another 5 sets of data when it is placed in the 90 degree arrangement. Okay. So, this is a typical screenshot of how this uh, well the data is being collected. You can see here that uh, this pink line shows the horizontal deformations collected through the horizontal LVDT and this is blue line indicates the vertical deformation which is collected using the vertical LVDT. Okay? So, this is the this goes the peak uh, maximum uh, strain value or the maximum deformation and it is this is a recovery and similarly in here this is this shown in the downward direction. So, this is the peak value and this is a recovery that is happening. Okay? Now, let us see how this is post process to arrive at the resilient modulus and the uh, Poisson's ratio. Okay. So, as you can see here, this blue line indicates your load pulse okay? and the orange line indicates your corresponding deformations. Okay? So, this is load marked here on this y axis and this is deformation marked here on the right y axis and this is time on the x axis. Okay? Uh, so, as the load is applied for 0.1 second duration. Okay, it is noted here, this is the load degradation of 0.1 seconds and there is a rest period of 0.9 seconds. Okay. So, as you can see that it reached a peak value, the strain reached a peak value uh, and after that your load unloading starts and then there is a rest period. So, during this period there is a recovery of the deformation. So, recovery initially there will be a sudden recovery which will follow somewhat like a straight line path as here. So, this portion is more or less a straight line portion. Okay? Thereafter you see that there is a curved portion and then it comes down like this. Okay? So, essentially you can fit three different curves for this portion of recovery. Say for example, in this first region you can fit a straight line uh, curve or a straight line and this is one region which is actually connecting the uh, unloading path and the rest period path. Okay? So, you have an, a recovery during the unloading of the load and a recovery happening during the rest period. So, a curve connecting these two portions is shown here, this is the second portion okay? and the third portion is of course, your recovery portion. Okay? So, you can consider three different curves for all these three portions. So, you fit a straight line for the first portion. As I said, the straight line portion in the recovery will be considered and you fit a straight line equation as y is equal to a plus bx, where y is the deformation and x is the time and a and b are the regression coefficients. Okay? And for the second region, from here to here, you can fit a hyperbola of the form y is equal to a plus b by x. Again, a and b are the regression coefficients. And during the last portion also, you can fit another hyperbola y is equal to a plus b by x. Now, this whole procedure is done to identify the two variables which is one is your instantaneous recovery and the second one is your total recovery. So, you essentially wants to find out what are these two recoveries and based on which you are going to find out what is the resilient modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Okay? So, this is how you split the curve into three. 
So, let us see how this instantaneous deformation is identified. So, first of all you have to get that straight line portion as I mentioned. Now, from where to where is this straight line portion? So, that is identified like this. Let T m is your maximum uh, de uh, displacement or deformation. So, here it is written as displacement and this is a time in the x axis. So, this is one uh, pulse of your deformation that is floated here. Uh, so, as you can see uh, slightly after the maximum load pulse your uh, or, or whenever the load is unloaded it starts recovery ok. So, that straight line starts just after your uh, top point or your maximum point is reached. So, let us the maximum deformation is marked as T m and the time corresponding to them that is marked as T m. So, the first point of start of this straight line is marked as T 1 as a sum of T m plus T a ok. Now, T a is a small time that is provided so that to ensure that the straight line portion has just started from that maximum point ok. So, that is given as 0 0.005 seconds. So, this becomes sorry. So, your first point which is the start of the straight line is T m plus 0 0.005 seconds ok, where T m corresponds to the time of the maximum deformation. Then the last point here is noted as T 2 that is when the uh, unloading is over ok, the, uh, where the rest period starts. So, T 2 you can denote as T m plus T b where T m is as I said when the maximum is reached and T b is the half of your load pulse. So, your load pulse is for 0 0.1 seconds. So, half of it is 0 0.05 seconds. So, this becomes T m plus 0 0.05 ok. So, your straight line is identified as from T 1 to T 2 which is as defined like this ok. Now, <clears throat> the second portion is from T 2 to T c you will mark it as a point marked as T c that is a hyperbolic portion. So, that portion is identified as when 40 percentage of the rest period is taken as that point when your uh, parabola uh, when your hyperbola reaches somewhat as a station uh, somewhat a coinciding point. So, in order to identify point T c as I mentioned T c is at 40 percentage of the rest period ok. So, you can mark it as 0 0.4 times of 0 0.9 is your rest period plus your initial loading time which is 0 0.1. So, this comes to around 0 0.46 seconds ok. So, 0 0.46 seconds in this noted here will mark your end of the second secondary stage or the second hyperbola. Now, coming to the third hyperbola you can uh, consider a distance from uh, T c which is your uh, 40 percentage of the rest period to around 90 percentage of the rest period. So, when it reaches almost the 90 percentage of the rest period you can assume that ok it has reached a steady state. So, the last point T d or T d is marked as 0.9 of your rest period which is your uh, 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 0.9 seconds is your rest period plus the initial 0.1 seconds. So, it comes to around 0.91 seconds ok. So, your tertiary is or the third stage of hyperbola is from a time of 0.46 seconds to a time of 0.91 seconds. So, this is provided uh, these are the uh, recommendations that are given by uh, NCHRP. Uh, so, as you can see here this is T a and T b is noted here and also this 40 percentage respiratory time and the 90 percentage respiratory time is noted ok. Now, now, in order to determine this instantaneous deformation as I said uh, it is the point when that instantaneous deformation happens before that uh, slow deformations continues ok. So, in order to identify that point uh, this is the procedure. So, first of all you will drop a uh, tangent through that straight line you extend the straight line from the first portion and you drop a tangent from the third portion at a time of t 55. Likewise, 55 percentage of your rest time that is 0.9 seconds plus the initial 0.1. So, this comes to around 0.595 seconds. So, at that 0.595 seconds you draw uh, you draw a tangent ok. So, both these tangents will meet at this point which is marked as A here ok. This points corresponds to the point of instantaneous uh, recovery. So, what you have to draw is that draw a vertical up. So, 
uh, this point where it meets with the recovery uh, or the uh, uh, deformation graph that point will be taken as the uh, deformation correspond to point A. Now, subtract it from your T max ok, uh, sorry I will see it as maximum deformation ok. So, you subtract this value from the maximum deformation which will give you your instantaneous deformation. So, I will repeat, so you have a, a straight line dropped uh, extended and you have a straight line uh, marked from T55, they meet at a point A, you can just drop a vertical down, note what is the time there and find out what is the deformation at that time and that deformation subtracted from the maximum deformation will give you actually the instantaneous deformation ok. So, this is how the instantaneous deformation is noted. So, the total recovery is from the T max that is the maximum uh, deform uh, the maximum deformation and almost when it reaches the complete recovery. So, it is expected that somewhere around the end of the test cycle your recovery is over ok. So, what is done is that you consider two points towards the end, one is corresponding to the 85 percentage of the rest period and the other one is corresponding to the 95 percentage of the rest period. So, how do you arrive at these points is that you take 85 percentage of rest period which is 0.9 plus your initial time. So, this will give you this time of T e. Similarly, you can take the 95 percentage of rest period time and you find the deformations at these points and take an average ok. So, this will whatever irregularities here will get averaged out. You note that deformation subtract it from the maximum deformation. So, that will give you the total recoverable deformation. So, maximum minus whatever re deformation is there at the this averaged out point. So, that will give you the total recovery. So, we have determined what is the instantaneous recovery and also what is the total recovery. Now, we will use this information to find out the Poisson's ratio as well as the resilient modulus. As you can see here, the Poisson's ratio is given by this expression uh, delta V by delta H and also there are four parameters I2, I3, I, I1, I2, I3 and I4 which is given here. This is based on the gauge length to the sample diameter ratio. Say for example, you are doing at uh, full gauge length, quarter gauge length or half gauge length. Accordingly, these parameters are provided here or the constants are provided here. You can substitute and delta V corresponds to the deformation or the recovery that is measured from the uh, vertical LVDT and delta H is the recovery that is cor corresponding to the horizontal LVDT and I said you have two measurements one is the instantaneous one ok and second one is the total recovery ok. So, in this expression if I substitute the instantaneous recovery part I will get one Poisson's ratio and if I substitute the total recovery value I will get another Poisson's ratio. So, similarly you come to the resilient modulus ok. The resilient modulus is given like this P cyclic as I said is the uh, maximum load minus the contact load is your cyclic load that you have applied. Uh, T is the thickness of the specimen and the delta H here is the horizontal uh, recovery and I1, I2 as I said are the uh, constants uh, for the arrangement and mu is the Poisson's ratio that you compute from the earlier equation. So, here also if I use instantaneous uh, mu that is uh, the mu that is captured using instantaneous recovery uh, values, I will get one resilient modulus and if I am using the total recovery value then I will getting another resilient modulus ok. So, if I consider I have two planes say on the both sides of your specimen you have plane 1 and plane 2 ok and in each plane you have a 0 degree alignment and a 90 degree alignment. As I said you will keep the two uh, LVDTs like this in one position you will test it and then 90 degree you will turn and test it. So, you have two alignments of 0 degree and 90 degree, 90 degree and at each alignment we will have a instantaneous value as well as you have a total value ok. So, all together you have 2 to 4 to the 8. So, you are going to see 8 resilient modulus values being measured from one set of data as uh, discussed here and uh, we have to have 3 replicate val uh, testing to be done in 3 specimens. So, all together you are going to see 24 resilient modulus measurements which is made for one particular specimen ok. So, you can 
average out this 24 resilient modulus value so that uh, most of the uh, irregularities associated with the specimen or in the test procedure or in the gauge length fixation may get cancelled out and you are supposed to get a reasonably good estimate of the uh, response of the material using this resilient modulus value. Okay. Now, again there are certain issues associated as mentioned here is that okay, the gauge length is mentioned as you can choose either full length or quarter or um, half gauge length. Uh, so, which one to choose and how it actually affects the performance is something that they have to be it has to be investigated. And second is regarding the conditioning cycles, it is mentioned that hundreds of conditioning cycles is enough for the material to reach that stable state, but it is not clear whether for all the uh, kind of materials and all for every test temperature, if I am if you are trying for different temperatures, will this conditioning cycles be enough for that attainment of steady state is second thing. And the second one is the uh, and the next point is the cyclic load and the pulse duration. As clearly mentioned you should go from 10 to 20 percentage of ITS as the load and pulse duration as 0.1 seconds. It may happen that in a very stiff material this load is not sufficient to create certain amount of deformation that can be measured especially when you are going for a very small gauge length because if you go from a larger gauge length to a smaller gauge length the deformations are going to be very small. So, you may require a larger load produce certain amount of deformation which can be actually noticed okay noticeable deformation. Uh, and also if you go for a uh, sometimes it may happen that in the larger gauge length at a particular uh, uh, for a particular mixture uh, these uh, load itself can create an excessive deformation happening in the material. So, uh, whether this choice of one cyclic load and pulse duration for every type of material is also questionable. And another aspect is that uh, within this load range as I mentioned whether the material will go to a failure stage or it is still in the that elastic stable stage is there or not is another thing. Uh, so, as I said the stable state whether this conditioning cycles is enough for the stable state. And also you do the test at 25 degrees Celsius though other uh, uh, test uh, temperatures are also suggested. As you see in IRC 37 the test is being conducted from uh, uh, 20, 25 and 30 degrees as well. Uh, so, it is not clear whether it will be possible for you to conduct that uh, the test at that kind of a temperature especially when you are dealing with uh, materials which are less stiff at that kind of a temperature range. Okay. Uh, so, these are some of the issues that are to be investigated and fine tuned uh, if you want to use this method uh, to determine the modulus value of the material. Thank you.